It was just such a night as this. With those few words, the captain started to tell a story, a story that he usually kept quite, but a story that was near the surface, near his personal surface most of the time. Now he was the captain of a passenger ship that carried some cargo. Decades earlier, he was the fourth officer on a cargo ship that carried some passengers. It was just such as a night as this. What brought those stories up to the surface of that man that he had to talk. You know, a captain of a ship, uh, he doesn't have an awful lot of friends. His crew is before, be, below him and they expect stern uh, obedience. He expects that. But now he needed to talk. He needed to tell this story what had brought these thoughts to the captain? Well, you see, on that passenger ship that carried a little cargo, on that particular evening, the passengers had gathered around the harmonium. We would call it an organ. That's probably what it was. And they were singing. And as the custom in those days, often the communal singing was hymns. And so it was this night. And as the captain was walking the deck, puffing his cigar, which reminded some of a headlight, Thoughts came to his mind, thoughts that he needed to tell. What he heard that night as he was strolling, the community singers, the hymn singers, was singing in this fashion. Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arms hath bound the restless waves, who biddest the mighty oceans keep its own appointed limits deep. It brought to him the time that he was a fourth officer on a smaller ship, a cargo ship that carried some passengers. On that night, a night such as this, this night was deathly quiet. The ocean was like the surface of a pond. There was no hint of a ripple except the rhythmic uh, waves of the ship as it went by about nine knots per hour, constant, ripples out from the bow. That's the only thing, deathly quiet, clear as a bell. All the heavens could be seen. The captain, who was the fourth officer at that time, heard 
the cry from the bridge. A cry that he had never, ever heard before, especially not in this type of night. Not on a quiet night. Sinking by the head as she goes along. What did he say? Sinking by the head as she goes along. The fourth and third and second officers couldn't hardly believe it. And the captain couldn't hardly believe it. But the tradition in those days to a certain extent, it still applies. The captain goes down with his ship, but how could it go down? There's not a breath of air. It's a new ship. It's only six years old. It's the pride of the line that owns it, going down by the head as she goes along. You know, this author is a very good author of this story. doesn't make that too, too much difference. Yes, she was sinking. Yes, she did sink. Yes, the captain went down with the ship. Yes, to many things, many interesting things. But I tell you the story, at least this much of the story, because I can't help but consider that this old world is trying her best to sink, sinking at the head as she goes along. The leadership of this world is causing the ship of state to sink by the head as she goes along. It happened all of a sudden. The crew couldn't believe it. The passengers couldn't believe it. Nobody could believe it, but it sunk. All of a sudden, Scripture talks about many things that happen all of a sudden. This one particular text I'd like to draw your attention to. Deuteronomy 7, verse 4. Deuteronomy 7, verse 4. If you'd like to turn in your Bible. Deuteronomy 7, verse 4. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you all of a sudden. Things even way back in Moses' day often happened all of a sudden. Was God 
going to de uh, destroy all of a sudden people that were trying their best to follow him? No, they had turned their back on God. They had walked away from life. And when you walk away from life, this world offers not very much hope. Not very much hope. If you don't follow God, you're going to follow the anti-God, the false God, the Lucifer, the Satan. You're going to follow anybody but God. And that's a dangerous, dangerous journey. The old devil has a way of doing things. One of his tricks is to call, cause fear in people. Fear. Another trick of which this church is well aware. Another one of Satan's tricks, his weapons, if you will, is to divide congregations, families, even an individual's heart can be divided. And when division happens, It's harder to stand. And of course, Satan's greatest achievement. Fear, dividing, and death. Remember the, well, let's put that off till just a minute. Does God have an antidote for us to take? In the battling of Satan's weapons. I'd like to turn to 2 Timothy 1. Seven. Second Timothy one seven. That book is about that thick and it's hard for me to find. I usually have to go to the uh, index, the table of contents. But I got a sticky note on this one, so I found it quick. I got a God bless the sticky notes. Second Timothy 1 verse 7. The antidote for fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That is getting rarer and rarer to see in this crazy old world. And it comes as an antidote for fear from the hand of our creator, from our God himself. This is the antidote for fear. A lot of fear going on nowadays. Have you noticed? A lot of fear. And the antidote comes from the hand of our God. Lots of problems in this world. Lots 
that we don't even need to start to try to delineate them. Let us just say that God has headed off, headed off all of these problems with his antidote. His antidote defeats fear. What about division? That other problem that the devil throws right in our face. You think you're such good Christians. Watch me divide you almost in half. The antidote for, divi uh, for division I have chosen as represented in Ephesians 4, verse 13. Ephesians 4, verse 13. God's antidote against the devil's dividing. Ephesians 4, verse 13. Let, it, let me bring it up so I can actually read it. Till we come, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ho, ho, when we put our divisions aside, when, I, when we put our distinctive doctrines aside and behold the man, then division won't have its power over us like it used to. This is God's antidote for the divisiveness of Satan. You know, our educated people in our denomination know this they know this. The third dart, main dart in the devil's quiver is death. I've chosen as a representative text to show God's antidote it's found in Galatians 6, Galatians 6, verse 8. Galatians 6, verse 8. We read in the 8th verse of chapter 6 in Galatians, for he who, who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap, what does it say? Everlasting life. You know what this means? None of the devil's weapons will phase us if that's what we choose. Okay, let's turn once again to 1 John, first chapter, verse 5. That's the text for this morning. And I'd like to read it one, once more. 
My favorite text reader read it just a few minutes ago. I love Armand's voice. He believes those scriptures. And in 1 John, the fifth chapter, all the way through to the second chapter, verse one. Let's read that just one more time with what we've said this morning as kind of a background. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that ye may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. You know, I had a, oh yes, the bulletin today. Did you notice the title of the sermon? You know, Karen is really a hard working secretary at the church and I wanted to give her just a little break so this time I chose a small title that she would have to type in a single word a single small word but a single important word because whenever if is used there is a question, a question. In those few verses that I just read, did you count the number of ifs? Did you? I didn't think we'd have anybody that would do that. Thank you. Yes, there are six ifs. How many of them are if God fails to do what he told us he would do for us. Zero, zero, none, nada. At all, as my old grandma used to say, none at all. All the ifs, all the questions are on us. And that means we have a decision to make. Oh, Brother Moore, I've made my decision 14, 28, 56, 89 years ago for the, no. That decision needs to be made every day to continue in the faith, to continue to be God's man, to continue to be God's woman. Six ifs, and I absolutely cannot leave the ifs 
at an unperfect number. Seven is that perfect number. The man that relates the story of the captain is found in Kipling's story, and I might add it is a short story. The, sh the slowest reader in the whole church can read it in 10 or 15 minutes. Three pages for the whole story. He also wrote a short little poem, and I'm going to in ask your indulgence if I might end my sermon with this short poem, who not only has a short poem, but it has a short title. If, the poem you've heard before, but maybe since this morning we have used a secular story to introduce very spiritual topics. Thinking on those things, see if you can't pick up in this short poem entitled, If, some very spiritual things. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blame it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph, and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it all on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve you long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor love Loving friends can hurt you, and all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that is in it, and which is more? You'll be a man, my son. Heavenly Father, we're thankful today to be in this house. For so many weeks in the past year, it was denied us, but not your presence. We need to be used to your presence when we're by ourselves. I need this bad. I need it bad. 
And we thank you that we do have this one day, this one week, this one however long it is that we can meet together. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Declaring to each individual their eternal value in Jesus and preparing them for his soon return. This has been Anderson SDA Church in Northern California. Thank you for joining us. For more information, visit our website at andersonadventist.org. We look forward to seeing you next time.